You're listening to The Diplomats Podcast on Asian geopolitics. As always, I'm your host, Ankit Panda, here from New York City. And this is Prashant Parmaswaran from Washington, D.C. Good to be back with you, Prashant. How are you doing today? Good. How are you doing? Doing well. Uh, so for listeners, we're going to devote this episode to digging into something that we occasionally talk about in the podcast, but I think it's actually been a while that we've done an episode uh, devoted specifically to the issue of public opinion and elite opinion. Uh, there's been a couple good surveys, and we're actually going to talk about both of them on this episode. Uh, the one that we're going to spend most of the time talking about is a recent survey out of the Singapore-based Institute for Southeast Asian Studies, uh, which contains a survey of Southeast Asian elites, basically people in Southeast Asian countries, the 10 member states of ASEAN, that would be in a position to potentially inform policy. So that includes everybody from people actually in government or who might rotate in and out of government to the academic community and the think tank community. It's also uh, journalists and other elites who write about these issues. And that has some value um, in, in the sense that the opinions of these people actually do find manifestations in state policy. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And then Prashant, uh, I also want to talk a little bit about the recent Pew Global Attitude mm -hmm. Survey, um, which contains a little bit more. Um, it's, it's a global survey, first of all, so that one's not focused on Asia. Uh, but it does have some interesting insights on how um, at least a few Asian countries, including several outside of Southeast Asia, uh, including uh, India, South Korea, Japan, and Australia in particular, are perceiving various moves by the United States uh, on the global level. Uh, but to begin with, uh, Prashant, uh, so, you know, you just wrote about this today uh, for The Diplomat, uh, the the Southeast Asian Studies, um, the Institute for Southeast Asian Studies survey. Um, what do you actually, you know, you you commented a little on the value of, of this kind of public opinion work. Um, how much how much do you think this actually tells us about, about where the moods in the region are actually swinging? I mean, I know you also travel a lot to the region and you yourself talk to a lot of the people that are um, the respondents to things like this. So, uh, so how valuable do you find these efforts? Yeah, I mean, I, I think a good way to think about this is um, it's it's one of several factors that um, are kind of determinants of uh, how foreign policy is made and how foreign policy is perceived, right? So usually the the headlines are focused around things like uh, developments that are occurring or or power or interests of various countries, but. I mean, there is a dimension of power. You 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 call it, you know, soft power, persuasion, whatever you want to call it. Where, I mean, there is this sort of impact that is perceived or real uh, with respect to what people think is actually happening, whether it's elites of these countries or just the general population at large. And so, I, I think that's that's kind of the most useful way to think about it. I I think the the way to actually think about the impact of it uh, tangibly is, you know, you look at, you know, two cases that might be instructive. You know, one is that we've talked about on this podcast uh, several times, actually, is President Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines, who has, you know, the Philippines is traditionally a U.S. ally, but he's taken this sort of charm offensive with respect to China. But if you look at, there's a huge disparity between what he's doing at the official government level and popular opinion in the Philippines, which tends to be still you know very pro us and also a little bit cautious of engagement with china those numbers have moved a bit but they've not moved significantly and that's an example of divergence in a democracy but you can also have you know sort of opinion shifts in countries uh that are not democracies you know a good example of this is vietnam right so you have the vietnamese government and we've talked about you know with respect to the south china sea and other issues vietnam's always seen as this this uh, country and government with a sort of one party uh, communist system that's trying to balance relationships between major powers. But if you look at the population, uh, the Vietnamese population is actually one of the most pro US populations across Southeast Asia and the Asia Pacific. Um, and they're very suspicious of China. So you sometimes you'll see this dynamic where the Vietnamese government is actually trying to manage disputes with China in a more reasonable fashion, but actually you have popular sentiment uh, rising up from uh, sort of a bottom up uh, pressures that they have to contend with. So these things are not to be ignored in terms of public opinion, whether it's we're talking about Pew or Gallup or or the ISIS uh, survey. Yeah, I mean, also, you know, when you're when you're polling strategic elites in a country like the Philippines, you also end up with interesting results because strategic elites also tend to be pro-American largely. Even within mm -hmm. Duterte's government, you have particularly, you know, if you look at the Philippines armed forces, um, much more pro-American than um, President Duterte and his sort of inner circle 
uh, specifically. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of the actual findings uh, from the survey. All right. So this survey has been done for a few years. So you do have somewhat of a time series. Um, and it's interesting to sort of compare the trends. But one of the questions that I thought was interesting um, and, you know, something that actually doesn't really, in my opinion, bode very well for the United States uh, is uh, if you look at something like question 26, which is if ASEAN were forced to align itself with one of the two strategic rivals, the U.S. or China, which should it choose, which is sort of the perennial geopolitical question in Southeast Asia. You sort of hear from certain people that um, Southeast Asia has felt like it has to choose between the United States and China, although U.S. officials mm -hmm. officially deny that uh, Washington is asking anyone to choose. But if you look at the results, I mean, Really, it's just three countries, um, and notably the Philippines and Vietnam, which you mentioned, uh, where elites are overwhelmingly in favor of aligning ASEAN with the United States. So in the Philippines, you had 82.5% of respondents say that the U.S. should be where ASEAN goes. Vietnam, with higher, 85.5%. Uh, so definitely you are sort of seeing the implications of um, Chinese policy towards Vietnam, particularly in the South China Sea, sort of really blowing back in terms of elite opinion there. And then Singapore is the other country at a more modest 61.3%. Uh, but every other member state, the other seven member states of ASEAN, um, Indonesia probably being the most even of, of the other respondents, uh, finds that ASEAN should really swing towards China, which overall leaves us with a you know, 45, 55-ish kind of split, 46.4% for China to be precise and 53.6% for the United States within ASEAN. What does that, what does that, I mean, tell you? I mean, do you think this is, um, this is a trend that's uh, being influenced by policy by the United States under the Trump administration or are there other dynamics at work here? Yeah, I think it's a mixture of both. I think on the one hand, it, it is sort of a product of the fact that um, just as you're having this dynamic of, you know, we, we really have seen, you know, you, you and I were at the Shangri-La Dialogue uh, recently, and that that's where you you kind of see at these various summits and meetings and engagements, you know, this, this sort of dynamic about choice and US-China tensions and great power competition over the past few years. But part of that is these countries actually having choices, you know, the United States, China, uh, but also part of it is, I, I don't think they're sure about what the U.S. choice is like, because under President Trump, I think you've seen a lot of uncertainties about uh, U.S. engagement. And at the same time, you're seeing under Xi Jinping, you may disagree with China's policies, but Southeast Asian countries can be very sure about what that choice involves, right? If you choose China, it's pretty clear what that is. But if you choose the United States, I think there is a sense of, you know, is this really just about, you know, the sort of protectionist tendencies that we're seeing? Uh, populist uh, sentiment. Is this just a moment in U.S. policy or are we going to see this uh, play out in the next few years? And we've talked about this dynamic where I, I think many of these countries and, and publics are waiting to see, you know, are we going to have four more years of the Trump administration or a shift and a reset of U.S. policy in another administration? So that's one dynamic. But I, I think the other dynamic, and this comes across in the, in the survey, um, is that beyond the sort of uh, choice between the United States and China, actually, Southeast Asian uh, elites actually see other major powers as playing a significant role, right? So Japan comes across, and this was true of the, the previous time that the survey was done as well, as being the most trusted major power in Southeast Asia, which is like over 60%, whereas both the United States and China actually fare uh, quite poor, poorly, uh, both of them. Um, and at the same time, when you look beyond Japan, the United States and China, there is a sense that, you know, other powers like the European Union, they do play an important role. They're not as big of a role as the United States and China, for sure. But Southeast Asian elites do see these countries as playing an important role when it comes to things like trade or the rule of law, or if, they if they're forced to choose and they have other options, you know, where would they turn to? Uh, and, and the European Union and Japan come up consistently as being... Uh, options that these countries would turn to otherwise. Right. No, I thought that was um, I thought that was a very interesting result. And like you said, it was also the case last year. I think it really mm -hmm. emphasizes that uh, Japan's investments over the years, I mean, even before the um, even before policymakers in Tokyo really took an interest uh, or at least, you know, spearheaded the uh, Indo Indo-Pacific policy, uh, Japan's been making investments in Southeast Asia for a long time, and a lot of those investments are continuing. Um, what is interesting, though, is that if you look at the appraisal of sort of hard factors like economic power, um, the the respondents in the um, ISIS uh, survey 
are pretty clear that you know China is the most mm-hmm. significant economic power in in Southeast Asia, but that still hasn't really won Beijing the kind of support that you might expect to see. Right? It's actually interesting. I mean, b- both the U.S. and China don't fare very well when it comes to overall confidence in the region. But it's notable that you know thirty percent of respondents see the U.S. as the most trusted partner for Southeast Asia, whereas only 16% have the same to say of China. And that's obviously in terms of uh, rank ordering the powers, with Japan being um, the uh, the highest responding power there. I think what is also interesting, you know, is India's relatively poor performance there. I mean, mm-hmm. with uh, New Delhi claiming to um, have pursued an act East policy since 2014, emphasizing uh, Southeast Asia and East Asia and its foreign policy. It is a little disappointing, I think, for India to find that 16 percent, I mean, almost exactly the same as China, view India uh, as as the most trusted partner for the region. I guess the good news, though, I mean, for the U.S. is that uh, the EU and Japan are ultimately American partners. Um, and it's a it's a good thing for initiatives like the Indo-Pacific concept, uh, which has actually grown a bit in popularity between uh, last year's survey and this year's survey, which shows that maybe some of the public messaging uh, by the U.S. administration has been well received. Uh, but obviously, you know, there have been other shortcomings, uh, which uh, you'll hear about if you talk to people in the region, uh, as, as you uh, Prashant especially do um, sort of you know things like the the White House uh, again being a no show at the uh, East Asia summit mm-hmm. at the at the highest levels of American leadership. So uh, so it's interesting to see that you know um, the Indo Pacific concept is getting more takers in Southeast Asia, uh, but there's still this um, this underperformance by the United States relatively. Um, but yeah, but I think for Japan, I mean, there's a, a there's a huge opportunity here uh, to uh, to really seal in a favorable position. I think Tokyo's been doing a good job of managing that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the your, your point about um, hard power and capabilities is really important, actually, because um, I think there's a tendency, uh, and this has sort of been sort of part of the conventional wisdom, that to think about China as being, you know, sort of China is the economic power and the United States is kind of the security power. Um, but actually, if you look at the findings of the survey, um, China actually fares well on both counts. So it's it's seen as a as a as an economic power, but it's also seen as the major influence when it comes to political uh, and security influence in the region. And the United States actually ranks behind on that too. So if you're a U.S. policymaker that's looking to think about how the how the region is actually structuring itself and and perceiving this, and you know this is elite opinion. I, I think if you look at popular opinion, it may actually be even more. Uh, sort of worrying for the United States. Uh, I think this notion of a bifurcation between China just being an economic power and and the United States having the security role uh, is actually not reflected increasingly in the data. So China is actually, you know, China's influence is being seen in a more uh, holistic fashion in that respect. So that's, I think, one of the findings that that was interesting. The other thing that I, I, I would point to that I thought the survey reflected on that was important is that you know there's a lot of focus on these major power dynamics um you know US China Japan um but actually if you compare that to the perceptions of southeast asian elites even though they are globally focused and and some of these folks are educated in you know western institutions the concerns that they have chiefly have to do with southeast asia themselves so if you look at you know top three security concerns it's not China or the United States. I mean, the, the top security concerns are political instability, you know, economic downturn and problems and climate change. So if you're the United States or China and you're looking to see what are Southeast Asian elites thinking about as, as the major threats and preoccupations, it is important to remember that, you know, these elites are not getting up every day thinking about U.S.-China rivalry. I mean, they have a lot of domestic preoccupations and other issues that are thinking about beyond the security and geopolitical issues. Right, absolutely. I think I think that's an important uh, important point to emphasize. Uh, you know, just to uh, just to cite something. Uh, you know, I was talking about the perception in the region that the U.S. is ultimately less less engaged, and it's good to back that up in numbers from the survey. Uh, so, you know, if you look at the overall number of experts who answered that. U.S. engagement in the region decreased. Um, it's effectively doubled since last year's survey. Um, and if you look at countries like, um, at least among four of the ASEAN countries, uh, Brunei, Cambodia, Thailand, and Myanmar, uh, the increase has been more dramatic. Uh, so it's it's clear that I think the administration's efforts to indicate that, you know, according to the Indo-Pacific Strategy Report, that this region is a priority theater 
uh, that message is not necessarily reverberating. Um, but yeah, I think I think your point on the fact that you know, yeah, not everybody in this region is obsessed with the broader geopolitical tussle between the U.S. and China is is very well taken. And actually, on that note, I mean, you know, something that's uh, interesting is to talk about the um, you know, there's a little bit of good news in here for a country even like uh, South Korea, because uh, um, one of the one of the findings that I thought was really interesting is that. Um, if you look at the region, you know, there's been a lot of hand-wringing and talk about uh, the 5G telecommunications issue, uh, particularly mm-hmm. the role for Chinese firms like Huawei in the region and elsewhere. Uh, but really, uh, in the survey, what comes across is that, you know, 38.5% of respondents across ASEAN member states uh, actually cited Samsung, uh, the South Korean conglomerate, as as their uh, provider of choice for 5G telecommunication networks. Um, the South Koreans are... Uh, giving quite a bit of attention to Southeast Asia, but certainly I think there's a big opportunity here, and this is going to be something to watch for in the future. Ultimately, it's it's unclear to me, you know, how how useful a survey like this will be in terms of predicting which countries are going to go with which providers for what kinds of systems. But it's interesting to note that um, Samsung is um, is perceived um, so mm-hmm. seriously um, as as a, a potential five G competitor here. Yeah, I think that that was a really interesting finding as well, because I think that this uh, Huawei issue has been presented and, and 5G more generally as kind of a U.S.-China issue. And and that really, the, the findings of the survey really show that this is not just uh, something for two powers to, to talk about in terms of how the elite see it. I mean, this really is a kind of broader landscape. I, I do think your, your point about um, U.S. credibility in the region and U.S. presence and how it's perceived is interesting. And, and uh, you know, this is not just something that happened in the in the ISIS survey, but, you know, other findings like, you know, Pew and, and, and Gallup have illustrated this as well. I think the big question for U.S. credibility in the region and U.S. presence has been, I mean, there is partly this assumption that some of this has to do with the fact that you have Donald Trump as president. And perhaps if you had you know, a different president in the United States, there might be some uh, changes in how the United States is perceived in the region. I actually thought that the ISIS survey partly disproved that um, in the sense that, you know, if you look at the findings, I mean, there was a direct question that was asked in terms of, you know, if you had a change in leadership, would you think about the United States differently? And actually only 60% uh, answered uh, in the affirmative. So you could look at that and say, oh, that's actually positive because you have the majority of the population thinking that. But I actually think that, you know, that suggests that there's a little bit more contestation on this idea about, you know, how much of questions about the U.S. credibility have to do with the fact that you have, you know, the sitting president versus, you know, bigger challenges and issues with respect to the changing balance of power uh, and U.S. commitment and credibility that folks are thinking about more in the long term. Uh, and I actually think it was interesting that that is a more contested question than sometimes is often portrayed. No doubt, part of this is about you know the Trump administration and some of its policies, uh, but not all, not all of it is. And I think there are broader questions for us to analyze too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so why don't we move on to the uh, to the Pew survey and kind of zoom out a little bit on some of the bigger questions? Because I think that's uh, that's certainly an interesting uh, part of this public opinion exercise, right? So one of the one of the things that the recent uh, Pew Global Attitude Survey looked at is perceptions of. Donald Donald Trump specifically, and his performance in international affairs. Uh, so unfortunately, Pew just collected data, and this is from the general public. Pew uses a methodology that's intended to capture public attitudes um, writ large, uh, so using a representative sample of the whole population. Uh, so the only Asian countries that were part of this were Australia, Japan, South Korea, Indonesia, the Philippines and India. So four of those being U.S. allies, uh, with the exception of Indonesia and India. And the results, I think, are quite interesting, right? So uh, you do come up with that, um, uh, you know, so broadly speaking, uh, if you look at the whole survey, the top line finding is that uh, in Europe and in Asia, especially among allied states, with the exception of the Philippines, Philippines is a notable exception here, um, attitudes or at least confidence in, in Trump's uh, tendency to, quote, do the right thing regarding world affairs is low. Uh, right in the Philippines, uh, however, there's a 77 percent of respondents, um, you know, felt that they would have confidence in Trump to do the right thing. And actually, another notable um, uh, country in that survey I found was India. Right. India is actually mm-hmm. quite positive about Trump. And and uh, Pew has this great chart uh, that they published uh, where they sort of plot, you know, the percentage of respondents that overall have a favorable view of the United States and and saw, you know, how how well that correlates to a favorable view of Trump. Um, And in both the Philippines and India, you do get more respondents. I mean, uh, you get a higher percentage of people saying that they're more confident in Trump than you would given the baseline level of pro-American sentiment, which is very interesting to me. 
um, and, and, and particularly in India, I think I think that's an interesting case uh, to look at the sort of um, affinity that uh, at least many Indian respondents uh, see towards Donald Trump. Um, and I wonder, you know, what the cause for that is. Uh, you certainly have had, I think, a level of personal rapprochement at the leader's level, right? So uh, mm -hmm. Narendra Modi continues to be very popular in India, and recently uh, he's made a big deal about his personal relationship with Trump. In September, uh, he visited the United States. You had a major uh, event here, the Howdy Modi event. Um, and I think that sort of uh, led to a general spillover of positive sentiment towards Trump. Uh, of course, India has been generally um, positive about the United States, uh, but that doesn't really go to explain why you do see an overperformance for confidence in Trump in India. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I thought that was a really interesting uh, finding in the in the Pew survey this year. Yeah, it is interesting because I I, I think you know uh, Pew mentioned you know in terms of speculating about what the reasons might be for this finding is you know one of the things they said is you know perhaps this has to do with. Um, the fact that in both the Philippines and in India, you see, you know, sort of populist regimes uh, emerge and you have a certain uh, aspect of the population that is thinking about President Trump in terms of alignment with uh, this wave of populism that's occurring in, in their countries. So, you know, that might be um, part of it. I would also say, I mean, the, the, obviously, the at least with respect to the Philippines, where the numbers are, are particularly high, um, I would say the the question is always, it is high, but would it have been higher under a different president irrespective? You know, given the fact that you're seeing developments with respect to um, the souring on uh, Duterte's China outreach, um, you know, because the Philippines is an example where we always see, you know, sort of high ratings with respect to the United States, um, you know, irrespective of whatever president you have, you would see it. And if you had a different president, maybe you would see a higher number. And obviously that's a question that, you know, you won't be able uh, to answer um, but that's definitely something that we see relative to, you know, both Japan and South Korea. I think you saw mm -hmm. much lower levels. And in, in Indonesia, uh, you saw quite low levels as well, in spite of the fact that um, the United States actually has been approaching these countries, um, you know, with a level of engagement that has been uh, notable still within the Indo-Pacific strategy. I think all three countries uh, matter significantly, but I just think that the aspects of certain policies are felt uh, more clearly, particularly in you know Muslim majority Indonesia, for example, um, all the way back to when Trump uh, started his presidency, when there were uh, you know rumors about you know the how the travel restrictions uh, affected Indonesia, which they ended up not being. Um, I think there w there was a sense among some Indonesians that this was seen as being anti-Muslim in some way. So I think that's a dynamic that you will see in particular countries and you know in the region, you know, particularly Muslim majority countries like Indonesia and Malaysia. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I just want to, um, you know, we're sort of um, running long in this episode, but I wanted to just mention one other finding that I thought was really fascinating from the Pew survey, and this all, it, again pertains to uh, pertains to India. Uh, so India is the only country in the um, among the six Asia Pacific countries polled where you had a higher number of people by, admittedly, by one percentage point, approving of um, mm -hmm. Trump's policy of allowing fewer immigrants into the United States. Every other Asian country polled and, and most European countries polled with the exception of a few Eastern European countries um, and notably Israel, which was highly approving of um, of the um, restrictionist immigration policies favored by this administration. Uh, the reason I find that so interesting in India's case is because the Indian government has specifically made immigration a major issue of contention with the Trump administration, right? You have issues like... Um, um, you know, working visas for um, for Indians uh, in in the tech sector and things like that. Uh, so I thought that finding was was quite interesting. And I wonder if that you know broadly sort of features into another trend that was uh, that came out in the Pew survey, which was that approval of uh, Trump's policies broadly is more popular with countries that have. Uh, either dominant um, right-leaning parties, and this trend mm -hmm. is most apparent in Europe, uh, where support for right-wing parties domestically translates to a greater approval of Trump. And I wonder if that, again, in the Indian case, is is part of the explanation. But we don't really have data either way. It's actually not something that Pew even um, comments on itself in its write-up on on the survey findings. But I thought that was an interesting mm -hmm. uh, outlier uh, that India was the only country in, in among the six in Asia where um, where that was the case. Uh, certainly, I think they'll be interesting to track. Um, I mean, especially, you know, now we um, have news potentially that Trump will be going to India in late February, mm -hmm. potentially to cinch a uh, trade deal. That's still unconfirmed by the White House. But I think that could, again, be an interesting data point on uh, how India's um, BJP government is uh, going to approach um, 
approach Trump in the in the final year of uh, what could be the first term or could be the administration's last term as we uh, as we head into an election year. Uh, so any other uh, any other comments before we close out on the on the Pew findings? No, I just wanted to say, I mean, the, the point that you flagged is really important because I think one of the things that, um, you know, are difficult to grapple with when you have this public opinion data is, you know, does does the public opinion uh, in terms of popular perceptions actually, you know, lead in terms of elite opinion and government policy or does it follow government policy and elite opinion? And I think, you know, you can make the case along the lines of what you mentioned there. Uh, that popular opinion at times can follow when it's being driven by a certain uh, line taken by the government, uh, that that sense that um, public opinion does follow that. And I think the other aspect of this that's important is, you know, as you noted, uh, some of these uh, public opinion data and, and, and findings are driven by contemporary developments and events. And so whether it's, you know, President's, uh, President Trump's uh, upcoming trip to India or this, this sort of um, still in the works uh, meeting between the United States and, and ASEAN, a sort of special summit. Um, I think these are all trends and developments that will be important to watch because they will shape elite views and popular opinion in, in Southeast Asia and Asia Pacific more broadly. Yeah, and absolutely. And I think the most valuable way to use this data is actually to look at trends over time, right? A single snapshot actually tells you very little. Um, and I think a lot of this, um, uh, uh, the Pew data in particular was actually collected in spring 2019, right? So, you know, I, mm -hmm. I referred, for example, to the September meeting between Trump and Modi. That doesn't explain anything because all of this data was collected before all of that happened. And, you know, even before um, all of the stuff with, um, you know, India's uh, citizenship law and Kashmir went down. So um, I think mm -hmm. that'd be interesting to see um, what next year's data suggests or the next iteration of of these surveys. Um, it's really it's really looking at trends over time and, and how they uh, wax and wane on many of these questions. Absolutely. Great. Well, Prashant, thanks a lot for joining me. Um, we'll be um, we'll be back to uh, talk about these issues, I'm sure, uh, not too long for now. Yeah, for sure. Great. Uh, so for listeners, if you like what you heard on the podcast, make sure you subscribe. You can do that on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or any other number of podcast providers. And if you've been a subscriber for a while, please do leave us a review on any one of those platforms. It really helps the show, helps other people find the show as well. Uh, so we really do appreciate that. And finally, before we close out, a note from our sponsor. This episode of the Asia Geopolitics Podcast is brought to you by Diplomat Risk Intelligence, or DRI. DRI is the Consulting and Analysis Division of The Diplomat, the Asia-Pacific's leading current affairs magazine. Since its launch in 2002, The Diplomat has been dedicated to quality analysis and commentary on events and trends in Asia and around the world, and is now one of the most respected publications covering the region. DRI inherits this approach and offers clients in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors worldwide access to an exclusive network of subject matter experts and analysts. Whatever your needs in the wider Asia-Pacific region, DRI can offer the knowledge and expertise necessary to anticipate and manage geopolitical and geoeconomic risks. For more information, please visit dri.thediplomat.com. Thanks a lot for listening, and we'll be back next week with more.